A new series uh, this morning, a few weeks maybe, we'll spend on the cross of Christ. I want to really take some time to think about the atonement, to think about what happened at the cross. What, why did Jesus have to die? What did he achieve through his death and resurrection through the cross? What was God doing by sending his son to the cross to die? Um, I want to just read a few scriptures this morning. This morning will be really an introductory week. And then over the next few weeks, what I plan to do is to take a, a portion of maybe each of Paul's letters, or some of them at least, and um, Romans, Corinthians, uh, Thessalonians, and uh, some in Philippians, all the letters of Paul, really. And uh, I want to take out a little piece of what he says about the cross out of each letter. Because at some point in Paul's letters, he always reaches what I would call a high point, where he, he, he takes out something of what happened on the cross, and he'll use it to teach around it, basically. And I want to take out each bit of teaching, if I can, or at least some of them anyway, and, and try to shine a light on different aspects of what was happening on the cross. So that's the aim over the next few weeks. That's what we plan to do. But I want to just read a few uh, verses. Uh, Romans chapter 3. And verse 21, if you've got a Bible, uh, if you haven't, just listen in. I'm going to read a few verses here, and then I'm going to read in 2 Corinthians, if you can get ready there. So this is God's word this morning to us. Uh, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward, listen, here's the words we need to understand, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Go over to 2 Corinthians, please. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 5. And I'm going to read <clears throat> from verse 14, 2 Corinthians Chapter 5 and verse 14, please. <clears throat> it says this, For the love of God, or for the love of Christ, controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, he says, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ, According to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, listen to this, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. <clears throat> we'll leave our, our scripture there this morning. <clears throat> so like I've said, over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at various aspects of the cross of Christ and from Paul's letters. And this morning is just by touching, by way of introduction onto this. And I suppose the question we might ask, it might sound like a stupid question, but it's always a good question to ask in these things is, why? Why are we doing this? Why are we looking at the cross of Christ in particular? Why don't we focus on, say, his teaching? Well, we do that a lot. We do focus on his teaching a lot. But why are we focusing on the cross of Christ in the next few weeks? If I had to answer that, why am I doing this? I would tell you this because as Christians, we need to understand that the cross is central and the cross is essential. 
in Christianity. We must not only proclaim the cross, but we must, each of us, explain it. We must not only go about telling people about the cross, but we must be able to explain the cross, proclaim it and explain it. So <clears throat> the cross is central to the reason why the Father sent the Son in the first place. Why did, why did God the Father send Jesus? Why did he send him? It's all about the cross. Christianity is centered on the cross. Uh, his main mission was to make his way to Calvary. As you read the Gospels, you're going to see very quickly that Jesus' main mission was to get to the cross and die and rise again from the dead, to take away the sins of the world. And that's what Isaiah had prophesied about him. When you read Isaiah 53, if you want to open it, if you can, very quickly open it with me. If not, just listen. <coughs> listen to what Isaiah wrote. <coughs> Excuse me. About 700 years before the Lord came. And some scholars say about 700 years possibly before crucifixion was even invented as a way of execution. This is what he says about him. The crucifixion wasn't invented. Jesus wasn't born. 700 years before all that, we read this, Isaiah 53 and verse 3. It's about the cross. He was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces like a leper. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Listen, before crucifixion was invented, by the, by the, the Romans weren't doing this at this time. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds... We are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, says Isaiah. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah talked about the cross. It was predicted that the Christ would go and suffer on the cross and die. The cross is central. Isn't that what John the Baptist said at the very outset of Jesus' ministry? When you read your Gospels, John the Baptist in John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 29 John shouts this out. He says, Behold the Lamb of God, who what? Who teaches us how to be moral. Who's a great example to follow. No. He says, Behold the Lamb of God. Why has he come? To take, who takes away the sins of the world. That's what his mission was all about. So it's all about the cross. And the Gospels are clearly given to us to show, that, uh, to show us the Lord's life and pathway to Calvary. The cross is where they lead us right to the cross, out the other side, and they show us at the end an empty tomb. Every gospel wants to make that point. Jesus came to die. Jesus came to die for you. That's what it's all about. And the epistles after the gospels, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you've got the book of Acts, and then you've got the epistles. And what they're doing is they're taking the cross and they're exploring it further. And they're showing us what does this mean in practical everyday life? What does this mean in the church? And they're trying to explain further what happened on the cross. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a part of an epistle each week and explore that. So Jesus, the point I want to labor is this. <clears throat> Jesus came not to be a teacher, primarily. I mean, his teaching is the best te moral teaching the world has ever seen. There's no teacher can touch him. He's the son of God. He's God incarnate. But he didn't come just to teach. And Jesus came not primarily to go around showing his power and working miracles. In, in, in Sunday school and all, and as we're growing up in our religious lessons, we very often were focused on Jesus the teacher, Jesus the moral man, Jesus the miracle worker. He, done, he walked on water, he raised the dead, he healed sick people, he was a nice man. That's part of it, but that's not the main part. Jesus came to be a sacrifice for our sins. And not for our sins only, for the sins of the whole world, says the Apostle John. So, if we think of Jesus only as this moral man, this moral teacher, this example who, if we try hard to follow him, all will be okay, we're going to misunderstand the very reason Jesus Christ came to earth. You must see him primarily not as a teacher, not as an example. He is that, but he's not that primarily. First and foremost, you must see Jesus on the cross. 
You must see the cross of Christ first and foremost or you're going to miss the point. You must see him as a saviour. You must see him not as a teacher but as a saviour first. Teacher later. Religion gets that mixed up. Religion tells you if you follow, if you listen to his words well and if you follow his example well maybe he'll be your saviour at the end. Maybe if you follow the moral example of Jesus well maybe the cross will be of some benefit to you if you earn it. That's not Christianity. Christianity front loads the saviour but Christianity says come to Christ as saviour first. After all that's the reason he came. And as you have received him as saviour then you learn by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk after him and to follow him. Not to earn salvation but because he's given it to you through the cross of Christ. That's why religion and uh, Christian religion gets it all mixed up. So the cross is the centre of the faith and you must make your way there first and foremost before you go anywhere else. And the cross is not only the centre of our faith, it's the centre of all history. It's the centre of all history. Jesus is the lamb slain from before the foundations of the earth. In eternity past, God had a plan. And in heaven, in eternity future, we're going to be singing about the cross looking back. So the whole span of history, if you like, is looking to the cross of Christ. We need to understand what God was doing there. So we're going to spend some time these weeks looking at the cross because no one can be a Christian without standing at the foot of Calvary and looking at Jesus and having something to do with what God sent them there to do. No man or woman can become a Christian even without grappling with the cross of Christ. And no one can become a Christian without seeing that Jesus did that for them. It's a personal thing. He came for the sins of the world, but we're all individuals and we all must individually respond to what we see and understand about the cross. So this is why it's so important that we labour it. Also, another reason why we're going to labour it is because it will help us. As you go out, you know, this isn't the place for evangelism primarily. I don't believe that the church is the place that evangelism happens the most or even is supposed to happen the most. I think evangelism happens when the church go out because we are the church and whenever we go out into the world we bring the message with us. So understanding the cross of Christ will help us better explain it to others. How can you explain a message that you don't understand? And yet we're commanded, uh, Christians are told, make disciples, go out and share your faith. If anyone asks you, well, you know, why are you different? Or what's the hope that you've got that I don't have? What's the hope within you? What's the reason for the hope within you? Peter says we're to do it and explain it with meekness and respect. But I would say that a big thing that we need to do is actually understand what on earth happened at the cross so we can explain it to other people. So, you know, everything, as you, as you encounter people, I, wanna, I suppose I could, we could throw a challenge out. Are we sharing our faith? Do we know enough about the gospel? Could you share the gospel with your friend if they asked you, what's the difference in you and me? What happened on the cross? That's why we're going to spend some weeks piecing it all together, explaining why he had to die, what happened when he died, why the arguments that people bring against it don't work. And we're going to learn to defend our faith about these next few weeks. And everything, I want to say this, everything that people out in the world are searching for, Everything that they're looking for in life is found in the cross. If you point them to Jesus on the cross, you're going to hit the nail on the head. You're going to get it right. You're going to get the right uh, thing that they're looking for because that's what it is. It's everything that he did on the cross is what they really need. You know, uh, I would say that properly explained, the cross meets the human's deepest needs. To put it like that properly understood and explained and it's the most unlikely place to find it. A, a dead Jew, if you put it like that, I said reverently, 2,000 years ago, naked, hanging on a cross, meets humans' deepest needs. How does it do it? There's hope is found in what looks like a hopeless place. There's life found in a place that looks grim and it looks like a place of torture but that's the place where you find eternal life there's power found in what looks like a place of absolute weakness there's victory found in what looks like a place Calvary of absolute defeat that's where victory is found 
There's freedom found in what looks like an absolute restriction. Your nails through your hands and your feet. The Lord was totally restricted, but through that he brings absolute freedom to those who come. There's forgiveness found in what seems like the place of guilty judgment. They spat on them. They thought him of no accord, and they hung him up. Condemned him as a criminal. But that's the place where forgiveness is found. There's meaning found in what looks like utter meaninglessness. Pointless cruelty. That's the place to find meaning in life, is the cross of Christ. Believe it or not. There's healing found in a place of brutality and a wounded mess. That man, Jesus, on a cross. That's where your healing's going to be found if you're going to get it. Everything we need is in the cross. And it's not because of anything else but this, of who it was that's hanging there. It's the Son of God. It's God incarnate. And it's all because of who it was and what happened after he came down from the cross. He was dead. He went into the tomb. And then three days later, God raised him from the dead, never to die again. Death has no hold off him. People are looking for what the cross can give and they don't know it. People are looking for guilty consciences to be cleansed. People have sinned that they need, they know they're going to come into judgment for. They have a moral conscience within. We all do. We all have it. And there's people running around. They don't know how to get their conscience cleansed. They don't know where to go with it. There's people running around and they're looking for meaning and purpose in life. They don't know that it's only in finding a relationship with God who made you, the Creator who knows what the whole plan's about. Only by coming to Him can you find the meaning of life. And there's people looking for help and hope in the face of death. And atheism doesn't have it. And no other religion in the world has it. Only those who understand the cross of Christ can explain that. How to have hope in the face of death. We have something to give. We have the only thing to give, really. It's the only message worth giving. It's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the cross of Christ. So we must point them to the cross to find their answers. It's an unlikely place to find answers to all these great needs. And the cross is God's way of transforming people. And not only is he going to transform people through the cross, he's going to transform the whole cosmos through it. Everything's going to be made new because of the cross. So I'm laboring the point as to why we're going to do this in the next few weeks is to equip us for ministry as we leave here, to be able to share our faith intelligently, to be able to understand it ourselves. And then the Lord had burdened me with three verses here because not only do we need to understand it ourselves and to grow in our knowledge of it so that we can share it with others, but we need to be careful because the enemy hates the cross. The devil hates the cross. He wants to pervert and pollute all the theology around the cross. He wants to, to get his hands on it and attack it as much as he can. That's going to happen more and more in the church. You're going to go into a Christian bookshop very soon and you're going to pick up books that are telling you all sorts of weird things about the cross that the Bible doesn't say. So we need to understand what does the Bible say about it. Uh, there's already, I won't mention the authors, but there's already books on the go that's telling us that the cross, you know, God's not a God of wrath. God's not angry at your sin. God's a God of love. And they, they, they take out this aspect of God's character, which is true, and they make it everything about God. And they say, the cross is just God showing you that he loves you. It's okay. We don't mention sin. It's just a display of love. And what they want to say is they want to say that on the cross, Jesus did not bear the wrath of God in your place because God's not angry at your sin. He's too nice. Don't believe it. This is why we need to understand the atonement. This is why we need to get our Bibles out. Because we're going to see in the next few weeks exactly why he died. But I want to say three, here's a few a few verses the Lord had laid in my heart, and then I'm going to, I'm going to finish this morning. Uh, if you want to open, please, 1 Corinthians, 3, uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. I've got three points to make very quickly. I'm just going to touch upon them. The devil and the world will attack the cross. And here's three attitudes you're going to find. The cross is foolishness to a perishing world, number one. The cross is offensive 
to a perishing world. They don't like it, number two. And number three, the, cro uh, the cross is opposed by a perishing world. Okay, So it's foolishness to the world that's perishing. It's offensive to those in the world who don't understand. And it is strongly opposed by a perishing world. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. Listen for the, for the mention of the cross in each of these verses as we close out. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 18. For the word of the cross, or the preaching of the cross, there it is. The preaching of the cross is folly. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. There you go. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So there's two different attitudes already. The world thinks it's madness, it's stupid, it's folly. Why would you believe that stuff? But for us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? This is God's weekend. Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolishness, made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God. You can't know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews, they demand signs. And Greeks, they seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and it's foolishness to the Gentiles, it's folly to them, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters, I'd add there too, consider your calling. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you're in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perished. Number two, go to Galatians 5 and 11 very quickly. I'm going to read it. The cross is offensive to a perishing world. They don't like it. Galatians 5 and verse 11. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offence of the cross, there's the mention of the cross, the offence of the cross has been removed. So what I'm saying here is this, is that we don't preach the cross in an offensive manner. We're commanded not to. We're commanded to be humble and make as we share it. So we don't go out of our way to be offensive. But the point is this, that the message itself of its nature is offensive. How do you tell people you're born a child of wrath? You're born on your way to hell. Unless you get the only saviour, you're not going to be saved. Unless you get to Jesus and repent. The message itself contains offence within it as you, as you share it. It's hard to tell people these things and for them not, you know, for the sinful heart not to rebel against it and go, that can't be right. That just cannot, I don't agree with that. I'm not having that. I think I can just do enough good and I think I can just do it my way. And I think I'll be okay. I'm not agreeing with all this Christian stuff that Jesus is the Savior and that we're all on our way to hell unless we get saved. And the, the message of the cross, I'm telling you, there's an offense within it that people can take. Not that we go out of our way to be offensive or stress that, but the message to the sinful heart carries offense. They don't want to submit to God. And Philippians 3, as I want to drive this to a close this morning, the cross is opposed by a perishing world. There are enemies of the cross, says the Bible. So uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, please. And it's Philippians 3, verse 18, that I would just cite for that very quickly. Philippians 3, and verse 18. Uh, he says, For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, many people walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. There's the cross again mentioned. 
Many people, and that mean that walk means that their entire life, the living of their life, they live their life out as enemies of the cross of Christ. So as we close this morning, we see basically this. Don't be surprised if as you try to share your faith as a Christian and you try to start to talk about the cross of Christ, here's what I want to tell you. Don't be surprised if you're called foolish. It's foolishness to those who perish. Don't be surprised if uh, some people t- say, you know, that's offensive to me. It's offensive to a perishing world. And don't be surprised if you face strong opposition as you try to share what happened on the cross with other people and ask them to come and believe in this Jesus. You're going to be called foolish. People will take offence and people will oppose you because there's enemies of the cross. Now, as a close, there's no neutral ground on this. I just want to throw this out and leave it there. I want to throw this thought out that as as all humanity stand at the cross, not only does it stand at the centre of our faith, at the centre of history, But it divides humanity. The cross divides all humanity. At the foot of the cross, there's only two types of people. There's the saved and the perishing. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. It's the power of God to those who are being saved. There's no no third group. There's no third way. It's one or the other. So at the foot of the cross, there's two groups. And the cross divides all humanity. Sitting here today, everyone in this room is divided by the cross. Everyone in in this town is divided by their opinion of the cross. That's just the way it is. This is the way the gospel works. Everyone, as they look at Jesus on the cross, has an opinion. Everyone is involved because we've all sinned and we've put him there, whether we like it or not. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone is implicated. We're all involved. Everyone is called to respond. God commands all men everywhere to repent. And everyone makes a decision. Everybody makes a decision. I mean, no decision. To withhold a decision is making a decision. You're not saying yes. You're in fact saying no, not yet. That's a no. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone is involved. Everyone is called to respond. Everyone actually makes a decision. And there's no other way out. You either look at Jesus' death for you on the cross and you hear the gospel and you go, I agree. That's, that's me. He died on the cross for my sins. Yes, I'm guilty of sin, as God says, and I want to turn away from my sin, and I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. What he did on the cross, he did it for me. That puts you in that camp, the saved. Or, you shrug your shoulders, you hear the message, you see the Christ of, on the cross, and what you do is this. You say, nothing to do with me. Or, you say something like, that's not for me today. That, that's, I'm going to think about that later. Or even worse, you turn into the mocking crowd. where You go, that's actually a load of rubbish. That's never for me. I will never go that way. I'll never bow the knee to him. But essentially, there's two groups at the foot of the cross. And over the next few weeks, why I'm bringing this out is this, because this is important. You know, this is eternity. This isn't just words of a book and this isn't just a theory in our head. This is true. God became a man and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Son of God, God himself, shed his blood for us to set us free from sin, to forgive us and to bring us to himself. What people call heaven. It's heaven and hell on the line. So over the next few weeks, I hope to see from Scripture the truth that the cross of Christ is far from foolish You shouldn't oppose it. In fact, I want us to see over the next few weeks that the cross of Christ is God's power. It's God's wisdom. It's God's love on display. It's God's justice on display. It's God's mercy to us on display. That the cross of Christ, far from being a ghastly thing, as the critics would ask us to believe, even theologians who call themselves Christians, this is a ghastly doctrine. It's not. It's actually God's love displayed to us, his justice, his mercy, and his offer of peace and forgiveness in Christ. I want us to see these things in the coming weeks. Um, I want to just bow in prayer now. And uh, I want to just pray with us. <clears throat> and um, if anyone doesn't yet know the Lord as Saviour, I want to pray a prayer of salvation. 
prayers don't save you. Uh, Jesus saves you. That's the point. And it's the, it's the response of your heart to the Lord. But prayers can often formulate what we need, how, how to come to him. There's no prayer in the Bible that says, say this prayer and you'll be saved. The Bible says, repent of sin and trust Jesus. Put your faith and trust in his finished work at Calvary. He died, he rose from the dead and receive him as Lord and Saviour. Basically, that's what the Bible says, but a prayer can help us do that. I just want to pray, pray a prayer of repentance. And then I'm going to pray a prayer of recommitment. If you've been away from God, and if you feel it, you know, you have responded to the cross at some point, but you've wandered, you've found it tough, or whatever that is, whatever that way it looks in your life, I just want to pray a prayer then of recommitment to follow, and then we're closed. So let's bow and close our eyes and pray. If you want to trust the Lord, just pray this with me in your heart. God, I recognize that I have not lived my life for you up until now. I've been living for myself, and that's wrong. I need you in my life. I want you in my life. I acknowledge the completed work of your Son, Jesus Christ, and giving his life for me, for my sins and my place on the cross at Calvary. And I long to receive that forgiveness and that eternal life that you have made freely available to me through his sacrifice. I believe that Jesus died for me, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. I repent of all my sin, I trust in the risen Jesus. Come into my life now, Lord. Take up residence in my heart and be my King, my Lord, and my Saviour. From this day forward, I will no longer be controlled by sin with your help. I will no longer seek to please myself with your help, but with your help I will follow you all the days of my life. And those days are in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. And then there's a prayer of recommitment just to follow the Lord. If you've ever seen that on the cross, he is your savior and yet you've received him as savior in the past, but you wanna recommit your life to the Lord today. Just pray this with me as we, as we close this. Dear God, I confess that I have strayed from my first love, Jesus. I want to recommit my entire life to you. Please help me to become the person you created me to be. Enable me to always live a life that is pleasing to you. I want to be a witness to others of your saving grace and of your power. Forgive me when I take back control of my life. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Renew my passion to walk more closely with you. You know all my desires and plans. Help me to fulfill your unique call and purpose in my life. Lord, help me to reject the pattern of this world and save me from being conformed to the world and its ways but help me to be transformed by the renewing of my mind as I surrender my all to you again today. Renew my mind and my heart. Restore the joy of my salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Lord, thank you for this hope that I have in you. Lord, please use my life to bring you glory, honor and praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing and answering my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.